Okay. You can find your seats, please. I'm not getting... Do I have it on, Danny? Okay, there it goes. Okay. Praise the Lord. Um, I know I'm looking a little, a little rough this morning, but you should see the other guy. <laughs> I was at the doctor a couple days, a dermatologist a couple days ago, and took about four pieces of tissue to have it sent in. I don't know if they're going to try to clone me or something, but I guess, I guess they call it a biopsy. But the uh, Lord's in control, so praise the Lord. I think I distinctly heard Lowell pray that I would preach till noon today. Is that what I heard? <laughs> I don't need that much time, but I do need a little time this morning. You know, most of the sermons that I give, I look forward to preaching. There are a few, and a very few, I don't look forward to preaching. In fact, I considered seven different sermons and started writing a sermon about Abraham offering Isaac called By Faith Abraham. And I was really set on doing that, and God kept directing my thoughts to this message this morning. Didn't really want to give it, but I'm going to, in obedience to God. My message this morning is a radical call for Christians to make a total surrender of their lives to Jesus Christ and to make a lifetime commitment to taking up the cross and following him. Some of my words may seem strong this morning, but my only desire, and I mean this from the heart, my only desire is to speak the truth in love and pray that the Holy Spirit brings genuine conviction to areas of our life that are not under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Christian brothers and sisters, it is time for the church of Jesus Christ to rise up and be all that God intended for her to be. And it is time for us as Christians to stop playing spiritual games and get serious about our calling as followers of Jesus Christ. Amen? God has no back backup plan. He's chosen the church, the body of Christ, believers, to be the ones who go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He has no backup. We are it. I have a couple texts this morning. The first one I want to read is Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 8. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 8. Familiar words. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. It says this, verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's what he did for us. And then 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. The most powerful books I read many years ago is a book by Charles Sheldon called In His Steps, calling believers to walk in the steps of Jesus, to be willing to suffer, to be willing to die for his cause. The title of my message this morning is It's Time to Jump. It's time to jump. Nearly eight years ago, our youngest son, Joshua, jumped out of a perfectly good airplane at about 12,000 feet in a tandem skydive. I was actually preaching this message. This is a revised version of, this mess of that message, but I was actually preaching this message that morning <laughs> just by coincidence. Now, I have to admit that while I admired his courage, I also thought he was a bit crazy to do it, but he did it. Let's be his memory. No, he's, <laughs> he's doing fine. <laughs> in Tim Bowden's book, One Crowded Hour, there's a description of an incident that took place in Borneo in 1964. Nepalese fighters known as Gurkhas were asked if they'd be willing to jump from airplanes into combat against their Indonesian enemies. The Gurkhas didn't clearly understand what was involved in this battle plan, but they bravely said they would do it asking only that the plane would fly slowly over a swampy area and no higher than 100 feet. 
When they were told the parachutes would not have time to open at that height, the Gurkhas replied, Oh, you didn't tell us there would be parachutes. <laughs> True story. The Gurkhas were committed unto death in the battle against their enemy. So recklessly abandoned to their cause were they that they were even willing to jump out of airplanes without parachutes. What a powerful picture of total commitment to a cause. The Bible gives us an even more powerful picture of someone who is totally committed to a cause. His name is Jesus. From heaven's portholes, God had viewed the battle for the souls of men since the fall of the, in the Garden of Eden. From the beginning, he had a plan for winning the war over his enemy, Satan. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that plan is at first revealed. When God said to Satan, who was disguised as a serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The battle plan would be costly, requiring the sacrifice of God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ. In the war, nothing would be spared to win back to himself that which was rightfully God's in the first place, his most loved creation, human beings, you and me. For God did not spare his son, but delivered him up for us all, says Romans chapter 8, verse 32. And let me tell you something this morning. If you'd have been the only person in this whole wide world, the only one, God would have still sent his son Jesus to die for you, my friend. He loves you that much. Humans had lost it. Or more correctly stated, humans by choice rebelled against their creator, and God would pay the greatest price to win them back. At a point in history, Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He arose from his heavenly throne, walked past the worshiping angels, cherubim and seraphim, exited the pearly gates, stepped over the threshold of heaven, and jumped down to this earth, arriving as a babe in a manger in that little town of Bethlehem. Jesus invaded Satan's turf to wage all-out war against his enemy. My friends, he left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny. T'was a lonely hill of Golgotha where he laid down his life for me and for you. Victory was assured, but victory would not be cheap. In his omniscience, Jesus knew that to leave heaven's throne for earth would ultimately mean carrying a cross up Calvary's hill. There is no place more secure, safe, comfortable, and beautiful than heaven. Yet Jesus gave it all up. Willingly sacrificing his own life to redeem your life and mine, Jesus knew it was time to jump. There's a poem. It's called Love Led Him to Calvary. Listen to the words of this poem. Love led the Savior in days long ago down to earth's darkness, its sin and its woe. Seeking the lost ones, his mercy to show. Love led him to Calvary. Love for a manger, abandon a throne. Seeking the sinful, the sad, and the lone. Yearning to win them and make them his own. own love led him to Calvary. Longing in pity, the lost ones to save. Braving the garden, the cross, and the grave. Seeking this only, the sinful to save. Love led him to Calvary. Love led him to Calvary. Love led him to Calvary, seeking the loss at the greatest cost. Love led him to Calvary. Hmm. According to the scriptures, as believers, we are commanded to have this attitude in ourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And we are called to follow in Jesus' steps. Now the battle for human souls still rages. Although the ultimate victory has been won by Jesus' finished work on the cross, and I want you to remember that, the victory is won, the war is won, but there are battles to be fought yet. And although the ultimate victory has been won, there are billions who have never heard the good news of eternal salvation. It is our responsibility to proclaim the good news. The Apostle Paul asked this probing question in Romans chapter 10, verse 14. He asks, And how shall they hear? without a preacher? Good question. If the Gurkhas were willing to risk everything for a heavenly, earthly cause, how much more should we be willing to risk all for a heavenly cause? 
Are we willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause? If hate can motivate men, women, and even children to strap bombs to themselves and blow up innocent people, how much more should God's love motivate us to give our entire lives for the sake of the gospel, my friends? Think about it. Think about how the enemy has deceived so many in our world today that even children of another religion are willing to die so they can kill those who don't believe as they do. Well, Jesus calls us to follow him with reckless abandon, forsaking all to serve him, surrendering all to accomplish his will. My friends, it's time to jump. However, and this is where it gets hard for me to preach this morning. However, I must be very honest with you. As I survey the church in America today, I fail to see the militancy necessary to overcome the power of the enemy. The Church of Jesus Christ in America, and I'm speaking of evangelical Bible-believing churches here. You see, churches who have forsaken the Word of God do not even qualify as Christian churches in my estimation. Ichabod, the glory of God has departed, has been written across their doors. Too many churches today seem satisfied in their sin and contented in their carnality. The spirit of the Laodicean church has infiltrated many churches in the United States. It was the Laodiceans that said, uh, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. While they're confessing wealth, and they're confessing accumulation, they don't need a thing, they're rich. That church said, God saw their real need. He says, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Hmm. In too many churches, comfort has supplanted commitment and apathy has replaced action. Like a prophet crying in the wilderness, A.W. Tozer warned the church many years ago when he said, entertainment is not only the God of this present age, but the God of the church stage as well. Think about it. So many in the world today are headed for hell. We stand perhaps on the precipice of the greatest persecution of the church that will ever be seen. I don't know. But there's something stirring in our world that there's going to come against Christians in a tidal wave of persecution. Some of our brothers and sisters in other countries are already experiencing that. And what are we doing sometimes as a church? We're focused on entertainment. Making people feel good. Now, I don't think we should come to church and leave feeling bad. <laughs> I mean, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. But sometimes, folks, we got to get real. We got to understand the days we're living in require a militancy, a radicalism for Christ. Where are the spiritual Gurkha warriors willing to jump out of planes without parachutes? Where are those believers who will walk in the steps of Jesus, steps that demand the dying to self and separation from the world, steps that will bring persecution and derision from the world, and frankly, even from some Christians? Where are the 21st century prophets who will cry out, stop, no more spiritual games, it's time to get the world out of the church and the church out into the world, amen? Amen. amen. Where are the prophets who will weep over the lukewarm condition of Christ's church and the sinful condition of Christ's people. Where, I ask you? Where? I pray they would be right here. Listen, I know there are multitudes in the church in America who are faithful to Christ and His kingdom's work. We have such believers here this morning. However, there's a large contingent of Christian soldiers who have gone AWOL from that battle. Unfortunately, too many Christians are missing from action rather than missing in action. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. We are commanded to put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. But I ask you, why put on armor if you're not going into battle? Now ask yourself this question. Do you really need the full armor of God to live the kind of Christian life you are living right now? Hmm. Let me say it one more time or ask it one more time. 
Do you really need the full armor of God to live the kind of Christian life you are living right now? I've asked myself this question before, while I was preparing this. Think about it. And please stay with me. <laughs> stay with me till the end. Do Christians need armor to waste hours in front of their giant screen TVs? Do Christians need armor to partake of entertainment that does not, that does not bring glory to God? Do Christians need armor to spend their lives accumulating for themselves stuff that moths and rust will one day destroy? Do Christians need armor to attend concert of gospel celebrities, Christian rock stars, or Christian comedians? Do Christians need armor to sip their wine and cocktails while justifying their unholy lifestyle in the name of Christian liberty? Do Christians even need armor to put in their hour in church on Sunday morning thinking they've done their religious duty for the week? I don't think so. While some of these activities may be permissible for Christians to participate in, let's at least admit this. We don't need the full armor of God to do them. Listen, armor is for battle. Let me say it again. Armor is for battle. And the battle is joined when Christians are feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting those in prisons, helping the poor, ministering to the hurting, traveling to a mission field far from home or to a mission field next door. The battle is joined, and I wrote this before I knew health resources would be here today. The battle is joined when Christians stand on the front lines confronting the evil of abortion and comforting the victims of abortion. And I thank you, Brittany, Britain, Britain, for your work and the work of others at Health Resources. We will support that ministry. It's important. It's needed. The battle is Christians ministering to the sick, the forgotten elderly in our nursing homes, and the lonely in so many homes. Let me get a little personal here for a moment. I don't want to take much more time, but this John M. that I've mentioned, I was asked by a former high school teacher of mine, an algebra teacher who's a godly Christian. He said, my, my former colleague, he's 93 years old, he's dying in Fargo at, at the nursing home up there, and he doesn't know Jesus, he's an agnostic, he's a hard man. He said, would you go visit him? And I thought, yeah, I'll do it once for you. <laughs> And I went and had spent about an hour and 40 minutes with this man who had been my teacher many years ago. I was probably a junior in high school. And I went and just listened to him talk about World War II, etc. We talked, we reminisced. And then I shared for about a half hour the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tears in his eyes, but he didn't, didn't receive Christ. This last... Um, the other day, I don't know, Thursday, whenever I had my appointment, um, went to see him again for the fifth time. First time I went to fulfill a request from a friend, from a, from a former teacher who I respected. First time I went for him. Second, third, fourth, fifth times I went because God put a love in my heart for this man and God loves him and I believe he's going to come to salvation. But the battle is... Christians ministering to the sick, the forgotten elderly in nursing homes, the lonely in so many homes. The battle is working for reconciliation and broken relationships and forgiving those who have hurt or wronged you. Please forgive. The battle is in loving the sinner to Christ, never giving up on that wayward son or daughter, loving your spouse with Christ-like love and staying close to Jesus yourself through the spiritual disciplines of prayer, Bible study, and fellowship with other believers. The battle is in walking in holiness before the Lord in a very unholy world. The battle, is in say, the battle is in saying no to sin and yes to the Son. The battle is dirty, the battle is long, the battle is hard, but brothers and sisters in Christ, the battle is what God calls us to. The movie, The Longest Day, maybe you've seen that movie, is based on the events on the la of the landing on Normandy on June 6, 1944. We just celebrated the 75th anniversary. I don't know if we celebrate, commemorated the 75th anniversary of Normandy. As I watched this movie, I was amazed at the incredible bravery and total commitment of the soldiers who landed on the shores of France that day. It was inspiring watching the heroism of these soldiers who stormed the beaches under heavy gunfire and parachuted behind enemy lines in the darkness of night. The story is even more incredible when one considers that most of these soldiers were in their late teens and early 20s. 
Certainly these men had better things to do on that June day than risk their lives in battle. And yet they were willing to jump. However, these men recognized something that far too many Christians fail to recognize. Their lives were not their own. They were part of a cause much greater than themselves. Their nation needed them and they were, and they were there willingly laying down their lives so others could one day live in freedom. These soldiers shared a common goal, the defeat of the enemy. They had been thoroughly trained for this moment. There would be no turning back. Spurred on by patriotism and motivated by love for country, they hit the beaches. It was D-Day, time to jump. Many would die. Many more would be wounded. But all answered the call to go into battle. Together, they would win the victory. Now picture this. It's June 6, 1944. Soldiers on a ship. It's time for them to get on the landing craft. The craft that will take them to the shores, to the beach. Artillery hitting the beach. Machine gun fire. Picture this. The soul soldier says, I think I'll just stay on the ship today. I don't want to go there. <laughs> it looks dangerous there. I'm kind of comfortable here. I'll, I'll just stay here. Or how about that soldier who's in the airplane heading over France behind enemy lines and is told in the pitch dark that they're going to parachute behind enemy lines. What would it be like if that soldier said, I think I'll sit this battle out. <laughs> I'll wait for the sun to come up. I'll wait when they've gone far enough in, then we'll, I'll parachute in next to my friends down there on the ground. It's ridiculous. Yet that is how many Christians approach the spiritual battlefield. The church is so nice. I feel so comfortable here. The sermons are so pleasant to my ears. The pastor and the people are so tolerant of my sin. I'll give some money so others can go fight on my behalf. I'll spend a minute or two in prayer for those fighting in the battle. You know, this sitting on the sidelines Christianity won't cut it in these last days. It's time you get in, get out, or get run over. <laughs> I, want, I do admit, and as I mentioned before, I want to conclude this, that the battle is dangerous. Battles are always dangerous. For some, service for Christ has led to death. But for all, it demands death to self. John Stam, missionary to China in the early 1930s, wrote these words. Shall we beat a retreat and turn back from our high calling in Christ Jesus? Or dare we advance at God's command in face of the impossible? Let us remind ourselves that the Great Commission was never qualified by clauses calling for advance only if funds were plentiful and no hardship or self-denial were involved. On the contrary, we are told to expect tribulation and even persecution, but with it, victory in Christ. John Stamm and his wife Betty were martyred by the sword in China in 1934, leaving behind their infant daughter. Now there is a couple who needed the full armor of God. And they had it. The Stams are just two among millions who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for their faith in Christ. Martyrs for Christ have lived and died for a greater purpose than their own comfort, security, and earthly gain. They were believers who followed in Jesus' steps, not regarding their lives as their own, but willingly laying down their lives for a cause much greater than themselves. They were Christians like you and like me. Or were they? What set them apart? One thing. A total commitment to the Lord they loved. A commitment to obedience that led them to the point of death, just like Jesus. My friends, God asks of us a similar commitment. If you're not totally committed to Christ now when being a Christian is pretty easy, what makes you think you'll be committed to Christ when persecution comes? And I believe it is coming. Listen, the plane you're riding in today might be safe and comfortable, but the battle awaits on the ground. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it's time to jump. Are you ready? Let's go! Francis Havergal wrote this, these words. I close with this in a prayer. Half-hearted, Master, shall any who know thee grudge thee their lives, who has laid down thine own? Nay, we would offer the hearts that we owe thee, live for thy love and thy glory alone. And the prayer I want to share with you this morning, 
I'll share the prayer and then I'll tell you who wrote it. Lord, I give, all, I give up all my own plans and purposes, all my own desires and hopes, and accept thy will for my life. I give myself, my time, my all utterly to thee to be thine forever. Fill me and seal me with thy Holy Spirit. Use me as thou will. Send me where thou will. Work out thy whole, thy whole will in my life at any cost, now and forevermore. Amen. That, that prayer was written by Betty Scott Stamm. Wife, mother, missionary, martyr. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20, I leave with you this morning. Lord, I give up all my own... I'm sorry, do you not know? It's a good prayer. I don't want to repeat it again, though. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Who, have, who you have received from God, and that you are not your own, you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. My friends, the ransom for you was high. You could never pay it. But you were bought with a price. And that price was the shed blood of Jesus Christ, God's one only son on the cross for you. He laid down his life. He left the splendor of heaven to come to redeem us from sin, from Satan, from eternal hell to eternity and glory with him. He did that for us. Let's do more for him. Let's get ready. It's time to jump. Let's pray. Our Father God, I know this message um, is somewhat strong in parts. Perhaps even comes across harshly. And Lord, I, I, I only want to speak your truth. And I want to give you glory for any work that you're doing right now in the hearts of your people. And I do pray, O oh God, that you'd work in these precious people. Lord, they love you. And they want to follow you in obedience. But there's so many distractions. Lord, we've grown comfortable. We've become satisfied saints. Oh God, stir in us. Stir in us a desire to go further. Stir in us a motivation to walk in the steps of Jesus. And Lord, may we, as servants of yours, serve you willingly. Sacrifice where sacrifice is necessary. And in the end, give all honor and glory to you, for you alone are worthy. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The hour is getting late, and uh, we're going to stand. We're going to sing. Uh, let's sing verses 1 and 4, if we could, on this, and then we'll have the benediction. Amen. When I saw the cleansing fountain, Open wide for all my sin. I obeyed the Spirit's wooing when he said, Wilt thou be clean? I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain. And verse 4, verse 4. Glory, glory to the Father. Glory, glory to the Son. Glory, glory to the Spirit. Glory to the three in one. I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all the blood can wash away each stain.
thank you for the honor you've afforded me to share with you today God's word. May he receive all glory and honor. Let's have the benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, and all God's people gave a rousing. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a wonderful week in Jesus. There is the missions meeting downstairs if you are part of the missions committee. God's blessings.